Hello, I'm Michelle Tapper with the latest from science. As restrictions gradually ease around Australia and state borders slowly open, many people are breathing a sigh of relief. But there are still lots of questions about what the future will look like in Australia with or without a COVID vaccine. And what's the best way to prevent another wave of infection over the summer months? Joining me today is Professor Rainer McIntyre, an epidemiologist who leads the biosecurity program at the Kirby Institute. And she's also part of a team of scientists advising health authorities. Hi, Rainer. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Michelle. A lot of people are feeling more relaxed than they have in months. And many people have stopped physically distancing and they've started hugging again. Is it okay to ditch the face mask and start hugging friends and family if you're in an area like Queensland or Canberra or WA? You know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and it's actually worse today around the world than it was back in March or April. So there's always a risk that infection can be reintroduced uh, and set off community transmission in Australia. And depending on what sort of precautions people are taking, if that occurs, um, it kind of determines how severely an epidemic might grow. So if people are being cautious, keeping their distance, wearing masks um, and generally being careful, then even if infection is introduced into the community, hopefully it won't take off as badly. Now, restrictions have slowly eased in Melbourne and we saw some vision over the weekend of large crowds gathering at the beach. What would your advice be to people in Melbourne? So I think, uh, you know, the ga there's been a lot of hardship that people have had to go through over the last few months and the gains that have been achieved in disease control through some pretty draconian measures, um, it's really important to hold on to those gains and not to lose them. There's still, you know, a few cases being diagnosed every day in Victoria. So if um, if we're not careful, then it could we could have another resurgence in Victoria. So people do need to remember that all that we've got at this stage is the non-pharmaceutical ways of reducing transmission, which is keeping your distance, washing your hands, wearing a mask. So we're definitely not out of the woods and people should still continue taking these kind of precautions. Now, we know that President Trump has tested positive to COVID and a number of people in his inner circle have also tested positive and many of them attended a gathering at the White House where physical distancing wasn't maintained and masks weren't worn. What can we learn from this? Well, it highlights the fact that these so-called super spreading events can happen anywhere, anytime, um, even in the most privileged of circles. And, uh, you know, that the, in the middle of a pandemic, you really do need to take those precautions, the physical distancing, the face masks, particularly in a country like the US where um, the infection, is, there's very widespread community transmission and very serious epidemic activity. Um, and if you don't take those precautions, then those kind of super spreading events can occur. So basically, don't let your guard down yet. Now, Trump has just been released from hospital and while he was in there, he was treated with a variety of medicines. What do you know about these treatments and how do they work? So he was given oxygen for his low blood oxygen levels, which is um, the most common treatment for people who need to come to hospital with COVID-19. The um, antibody cocktail that he uh, received, which is two monoclonal antibodies from a company called Regeneron, um, ha is experimental at this stage. Um, there's no phase three clinical trial data proving that it works, but there are early phase trial data that do show promising results that it does decrease the, the amount of virus in the body, um, particularly if you have a high amount of virus to begin with, and it um, potentially mitigates the the symptoms. Um, the drug remdesivir does have phase three clinical trials, which is the sort of ultimate evidence that we look for, which is showing protection in people, in human beings, um, from the effects of the disease. And that does show a modest benefit in terms of um, it, making the time to recovery faster. 
uh, and it's probably the most promising drug we have so far. The dexamethasone it was a bit unusual. It's an old drug. It's been around for a very long time. It's a corticosteroid, um, which both reduces inflammation but also um, suppresses the immune system and suppresses the adrenal glands. Um, the trials of dexamethasone in, with COVID-19 have been really in very sick patients, people who are generally in ICU either with pneumonia or receiving ventilation. Uh, so to see it given to someone who's ambulant, who's walking around, um, who's not at that very severe end of the spectrum is unusual. Um, and there's obviously the slight concern that um, it also does suppress the immune system. So there has been progress for treatments over the past seven months. What about a vaccine? It normally takes about a decade to develop one, but obviously there's a lot of pressure for an accelerated process here. How is it possible to do that? And where are we at with clinical trials with regards to a vaccine? So whilst the process for vaccine development is accelerated, um, it's still going through the same um, set of steps that every drug or vaccine needs to go through, which is, first of all, preclinical studies and animal studies, phase one trials, phase two trials, and phase three efficacy trials. Um, so all the vaccines are going through that, except uh, a couple that have been um, given to people in countries like Russia and China without such data being published. Um, however, um, most of the vaccine candidates, there's many now that have gone through phase one and two trials and several in phase three trials at the moment. Now, obviously, it's a bit of a million dollar question, but when do you think that we might likely see a viable vaccine? I think it's likely in the first half of next year, in 2021. However, um, the supply is the big question. You know, um, even if a vaccine is proven to protect people in a phase three clinical trial, um, the none of the vaccine technologies um, have really the ability to scale up production massively. So we will expect that supplies will be short initially. Um, wealthy countries will probably buy up most of it and other countries will have to wait in line. Um, so initially, probably the scenario will be that we don't have enough vaccine for everybody um, and the first responders, health workers, etc., get vaccinated first. So looking into the crystal ball, the end of 2021, could we see the majority of the world vaccinated or are we talking a lot longer than that? I think it'll take longer than that. I mean, you know, when we talk about the majority of the world, there will be, again, it's an equity issue. There is there is a an initiative called COVAX through um, CEPI and the WHO, which is trying to ensure equitable access to a minimum number of doses for all countries, and many countries have signed up to that, including Australia. However, um, it, it is true that most countries won't be able to afford or procure enough vaccine for their whole population very quickly. So we may see a situation where there remain hotspots of COVID in low-income countries around the world um, for quite a while, whilst um, wealthy countries do manage to get their populations vaccinated. And the World Health Organization has flagged that a vaccine is not a silver bullet in our protection against COVID-19. What exactly does this mean? Yeah, so one possible outcome is that the vaccine um, doesn't have a very high efficacy or that, you know, we don't get a vaccine that has a high enough efficacy. You need a vaccine that's at least 70 to 80 percent protective to be able to achieve herd immunity. If you've got a vaccine that's only 50% effective, and many of the trials are powering their trials for expecting 50% um, efficacy or around that figure, um, you can't achieve herd immunity because you're not, be able, you're not able to achieve immunity in a sufficient proportion of the population with a, with a vaccine that's only 50% effective. However, if you've got a vaccine that's low efficacy, you can still achieve a good outcome if the vaccine reduces the severity of the disease. So if the majority of people who get vaccinated have a mild common cold-like infection instead of 
a serious uh, life-threatening infection, that's also a good achievement. But that also means that the virus will continue to circulate. And as, as I said, it's likely we'll have hot spots in the world in low-income countries. So is it a case that of we're just going to have to live with it, do you think? It really depends on what kinds of vaccines um, come out in the end, how effective they are and how quickly they can be scaled up and made accessible worldwide. So we're about seven months into this pandemic. What do we know about the long-term health effects of COVID-19 on people? Uh, We don't know much, and there's still a lot we don't know about this virus. We're learning every day. There's new information every day, but we do know that there seem to be quite substantial long-term effects. There's chronic fatigue, a chronic fatigue syndrome, There's, you know, people are reporting things like hair loss. And it's unknown really how much of these syndromes are due to microvascular effects. So we also know that the virus can directly affect the heart muscle, um, but also the blood vessels. It can cause heart failure. It can cause heart attacks, strokes, um, other vascular syndromes and how much of some of these um, long-term effects are are caused by vascular pathology, we don't know. It is possible that it will turn out to be, you know, um, cardiac or or, um, neurological in in nature. So what would you say to people who have said, look, it's nothing more than just a, a common cold and we shouldn't be afraid of it, In fact, President Trump had said something along those lines. Uh, What would your response be to that? Well, I think it's too early to say, and there could be quite a substantial burden of disease caused by the long-term effects of COVID-19. And um, it's far too early to really tell. All we know at this stage is there does seem to be quite significant long-term effects in in a substantial proportion of survivors. Australia has always said that we're taking a suppression strategy based on testing and tracing. Do you think that the testing numbers have gone down though now as we seem to relax a little bit? And is this a good thing? Testing numbers have gone down, but testing numbers are generally um, a function of how much disease there is in the community. If you've got lots and lots of disease but low testing, then you should be worried. But, But if there's hardly any disease around and the test numbers go down, that's okay. Really what you need to look at is the ratio of tests to cases. And finally, what's your advice to people who say, we've got this pandemic managed in Australia, we should just get back to normal? What would you say? Well, it depends on what get back to normal means. If we do have zero community transmission, then Yes, you can do a lot of normal things. Um, the, however, the international borders are the major factor. Closing the international borders is the most important strategy that Australia has undertaken to achieve the successful status we have today. If we open the international borders, then um, we'll be bringing in infection on a regular basis and the chance of community transmission will increase substantially. Yeah, it's obviously a a difficult situation to manage. Professor Rainer McIntyre, thanks for your great wisdom and insight and also for your time. We appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Michelle. And don't forget, for regular video updates from the Australian Academy of Science, make sure to follow us on social media. I'm Michelle Tapper. See you soon. Mm -hmm.